Right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, we'll go ahead and begin. Hopefully, this will work. Um, so, yeah, I'm Jonathan. I've been at uh, involved in GNOME for a very, very long time. I've um, uh, been doing this for a while. I'm at Endless now, at Endless Mobile. We are making computers for the developing world, and I want to talk a little bit about what that means to us and what it can mean to GNOME. So, first things first. So, I just want to talk about the internet, first of all. It's something that everyone takes for granted. It's a ubiquitous part of our life. It's a big part of computing. It's something that I think uh, that GNOME developers think is very uh, almost omnipresent. And in fact, um, you, you know, every year we see more and more people get on the internet. It's a huge part of modern society and fabric. There are 200 million people. Uh, got on the internet last year alone. Um, and it's it's a very, you know, it's associated with uh, so many uh, important parts of modern life that uh, there's a lot of uh, desperate need for it, especially in developing worlds. What we find is that, um, you know, just a, a small increase in broadband penetration can lead to a one to three percent GDP growth in uh, countries that have low internet penetration. But one thing that's sort of interesting uh, about the internet um, is that it's not ubiquitous. It's not evenly spread out. In fact, it's not even uh, universal. Over half of humanity doesn't have access to it today. Um, when I said the 200 million people got online last year, that sounds like a lot, but that still leaves 4 billion people without access to the internet or reliable access to the internet. Um, and that's, that's over half of humanity. Only 40%, 43% of humanity currently has access to uh, the internet. And um, I think, y you know, it's an interesting... Um, uh, I don't want to put this. Um, as you know, you know, as we're watching the internet expand and watching the software industry uh, move to an always online world, we're really seeing a split between internet haves and internet have-nots. Um, the software industry has very much embraced sort of cloud computing. It's embraced things like software as a service and uh, sort of this always on and this always available mentality. And um, that's just not the reality for over half of the world. Um, and it's, it's really kind of a shame, but it's also a great opportunity for GNOME. And it's basically what I want to talk about for the rest of this talk. And I'm, I know I'm as guilty of this as anyone else. I know nine years ago, as part of the Red Hat desktop team, when we came and we started talking about GNOME online desktop, we thought that was the greatest thing. We talked about making sure that we always took advantage of online support. We talked about having great integration with all these cloud services that were starting to come online, like Google, like Facebook, like all, everything else. And that's been a great boon for the desktop. It's sort of the way that GNOME has developed, um, and the computing industry as a whole has developed, but it has also left a lot of people behind. So let's talk a little bit about how things are growing. Um, uh, Facebook did a study. They started an organization called internet.org. And they actually studied this over the past uh, couple of years to try and figure out how the internet is growing. And they identified sort of four main barriers to growth in the world that was sort of preventing people from actually getting access to the internet. Some of these seem very basic and obvious, but it is worth bringing them up. So the first is availability. Um, the infrastructure has not been built out in a lot of the world to provide bandwidth and access to people. Um, you, you know, uh, the primary way that people actually get their internet today is over cell service. The majority of growth is over cell service. People aren't doing wires into a lot of the rural parts of the world. And um, the economics just don't make sense for that. Uh, affordability is the other main reason why people don't have it. This is very much tied with accessibility. Um, it's very expensive to buy bandwidth. Um, and for a lot of people, they cannot pay for it. Um, relevance, this is kind of an interesting one, but the internet is very English-centric. Um, and 
uh, to a lesser extent, other languages too. But if you don't have content that's relevant for you, you tend to not use it. And then finally, uh, you know, literacy is always an issue. So, um, you know, this is why people don't use the internet right now. Um, and uh, when you go out and talk to people, they know that it's something that they can use to better their lives. They know it is something that's really relevant to them. They know it's important for the future of their families, for their countries, for their communities. And they would like to find ways to get access to a lot of the, the benefits of the internet, but then don't necessarily uh, do it. So let's break these down. So this is a very visual, I love this map. This is a very visual view of what connectivity looks like worldwide. Um, this is actually better than it was like three or four years ago. Um, but these are kind of the available speeds that are um, that you can see. You can, and actually, China is dark. China is dark because we don't have data on that one. So China is actually a little bit more uh, wired than that. Um, but you can see the United States and Europe is pretty good connectivity, and then the rest of the world. It it, it uh, uh, India is is okay. There's a lot of 3G support there. Um, but India is an interesting story because even though it's available, um, because it's so densely crowded, a lot of people still don't use it. Over half the country does not. And then what you can see is that when you get into South America and Africa, there are enormous dark areas. Um, So then let's talk about how it's been growing. I know that people for years have been saying everyone's going to be wired in the future. Everyone is going to be uh, uh, online. And if you actually look at the trend growth outside of, I put the United States in here, but Europe actually has very similar or better trend lines. Um, but outside of it, if you look at um, the way that internet growth has gone, uh, especially at... Uh, you know, the speeds are going up in the developed world, and it's basically linear. People do not have the same bandwidth outside of the United States and Europe. Um, so what we find is that... Um, actually, I want to go one more slide here, too. And then this is actually a more interesting graph. If you look at sort of the breakdown by uh, actual bandwidth, there's a little bit more growth at the lower ends of the speeds over here in some of the developing countries. But when you get up to actual bandwidths like 10 megabits or 8 megabits, it's basically non-existent. It's just very few people have speeds of that level. And if we look at the, um, you, you know, the actual penetration on the bottom, um, that's a luxury that doesn't exist uh, outside of the Western world. So when... The majority of GNOME developers obviously come from areas in the yellow areas. There are the green areas up top. And I feel very strongly that that impacts the desktops that we are building. And that if we want to um, uh, actually be relevant for the rest of the world, we really need to have that mindset and mentality and really understand that uh, both bandwidth and uh, connectivity and general access is not something that we can take for granted. And it's sort of very pervasive throughout the desktop, and uh, we need to rethink that. So let's take a look at Brazil in particular. I have a couple more graphs that I want to bring up before I switch this talk a little bit. But I think Brazil is particularly interesting because it's sort of a... a um, you know, despite all the troubles in the news, it's a fairly rich country in its own way. It's hosting the Olympics right now. And if you look at how um, the actual penetration of uh, a bandwidth is, something like uh, a quarter of Brazilians here have 8 megabit and up, which is sort of a, a pretty decent speed. That's something you can watch movies with, and that's something you can watch, um, you, you know, use for your home. And that's predominantly very urban, and then um, a large chunk of the country has modem level speeds here on the left, you know, 256K as an actual download. And for a lot of people, this is very, um, um, this is the only thing that's available to them. It's not that they can pay for more, or that, you know, they can't afford it. It's the way that the infrastructure is built. Um, 
is such that there's just not the bandwidth or the throughput available. In fact, we had a conversation at Endless with head of a major telecom in Mexico, and we asked him, you know, are you going to build out to rural areas? And uh, um, he told us, no, I'm, I'm not. The money's just not there. And, um, you, you know, I do what the government requires and no more, no less. But all of the actual development is going into the urban areas where they can... Uh, uh, recoup a lot of their investments. And what you see in practice is you have cell services just set up sort of repeater after repeater after repeater. And if you don't set up that uh, fiber or something like that to send the network back, you don't get any additional throughput to an area. You just get more coverage shared with the same initial bandwidth going in. So the actual bandwidth to each individual node goes down with each additional cell tower that they add. Um, and then, uh, I thought I had one more graph. So, oh, yeah, I do have one more graph. I want to go back to this one in a second. But you can actually, this graph is particularly interesting because this is Brazil as well. Um, Brazil actually categorizes people by population, or sorry, by income. They have like class A people, class B people, class C people. I don't, this is their terminology, not mine. Um, but what they've... Um, said is that Class A is sort of people with a f fairly high income, and not surprisingly, you see uh, them predominantly, about half of them are have uh, 8 megabit and up, access to 8 megabit and up bandwidth. But even within this demographic, you see people with modem speeds because they simply don't have access to higher speeds. Um, and then over 50% of the country is, oops, I went forward here, is in this area here where you have a much flatter area of speeds and it's just not the same availability. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about affordability too because it's not just having the infrastructure available, it's also being able to uh, pay for the internet that you may or may not want um, or want. Um, and the reality is it's too expensive to get access in a lot of the world. Um, you know, something that's very simple, like a 500 megabit, megabyte plan for like a, a cell plan. Um, that can be, you know, in India, it's about 17 hours of work uh, with assuming an average salary for you to be able to recoup that 500 megabit uh, plan. So what you see is people will often save up quite a lot for one plan. They'll get the plan, they'll use it up in a couple of days, and then go a month with basically no data at all, and then wait for next month when they can afford to top it up. Um, 500 megabits, I, megabytes is not a lot of bandwidth, as you all know. And it's really um, sort of interesting to think about us talking about freedom and free software and uh, it, you know, it's, it's a great conversation for us to have, but if it's a couple months salary to be able to download the source code to actually work on it or anything like that, how free is it really? How much access is there really? Um, and uh, it, it just means that there's a lot less relevance uh, in practice. Um, so, and then finally, I want to say, uh, I mentioned this briefly earlier, but... Um, uh, for a lot of the world, the content that's available is not actually relevant to them and not available in their language. Um, and, uh, you know, people get online and then they find out that the things they really care about is not there or the, the problems that they face are not necessarily being addressed. Um, literacy is obviously a, a, a global problem, but it's something that, um, y you know, you see in practice uh, uh, makes it a lot less relevant to them. Right. So uh, hopefully from this you got a good sense of what the rest of the world faces with regards to both internet access and, um, uh, uh, you know, availability and also relevance. Um, Basically, I'm here to make the claim that GNOME should care about this, that they should think about it and factor it into our development and keep it in mind. Um, one of the great things
things um, that we think about at Endless is that a lot of the world uh, does want to get online. They do want to get access to the internet. They do want a computer. They do want a desktop. They haven't picked one yet. They may think they want Windows. They may have seen it. They may not have. Um, they certainly have had access to uh, cell phones in some cases or, or smartphones, but it means that there are a lot of people out there that need a computing experience that works for them, and I think this is a great opportunity for GNOME to sort of expand its reach and make a desktop that is relevant to uh, a very underserved and interested and, frankly, hungry uh, population. So before I go on, I just sort of want to talk about data distribution. Um, this is a, uh, if you sort of think about the way that a lot of data is uh, distributed on the internet, there are basically two kinds of, um, of data. There's sort of instant data. It's the data that's relevant for you when you ask for it. So it's things like, um, you know, text messages, it's things like Facebook messages, it's WhatsApp, it's an email, it's getting a stock price, it's getting the weather, it's finding out what, when your market is open. It's a lot of different things like that. This is a tiny portion of the actual bandwidth that you see. And if you remember when I mentioned internet.org, that's a big consortium that started by Facebook. Um, they're primarily focused on this aspect of the internet. Um, not surprisingly, Facebook and Google are very interested in making sure that the rest of the world has access to these things. So they've sort of cut, you know, sweet deals with telcos, although they had some setbacks recently on trying to make these things a lot more affordable and breaking the world into sort of the instant data and the rest of the data. And um, and these are things that um, y you know you can get on feature phones and is a little bit more widely available and obviously hugely relevant to everyone's lives. Then the other half of the internet is sort of cacheable data is what we're calling it. Uh, and this is data that's it's like web pages, it's videos, it's, it's um, the vast bulk of the bandwidth that is consumed. And this is the part that's extremely expensive. Um, the big boys like Google and you know Amazon use something called a CDN, which is a content distribution network, to sort of cache it globally and make sure that the net, the data that they want to distribute is available locally. And um, uh, there's a fair amount of infrastructure that goes into this. Um, and um, uh, you know, it's fairly relevant. It's what a lot of the information on the internet, a lot of the entertainment things that you see on the internet uh, fit into, um, but it's just non-existent outside uh, of, you know, the developing world. If you remember that graph I showed earlier, that map of the world, um, a lot of the yellow and orange areas or the dark areas, they just don't have access to this, except for it's actually not entirely true. Um, where there is a will, there is a way. Humans are amazing. There are a lot of different ways that you can see um, a distribution of sort of this cacheable data um, uh, take place. I'm going to talk about a few of them in just a second. Um, but I want to propose that we start thinking about building an asynchronous internet inside GNOME. Um, what's an asynchronous internet? Um, it's something that we're trying to define at Endless, but basically our view is that if you break the world into, or the internet into sort of cacheable data and instant data, if you actually find other ways to get that cacheable data to people, um, they can take advantage of it and they can find other ways to get it and have it on their machine and, um, uh, you, you know, potentially uh, use it when they need it and not have to go and get it. So what do I mean by asynchronous internet? What I mean is an internet where the cacheable data is delivered and then you use it later. Um, so let me give you a couple examples of that in practice. 
Um, in Cuba, there's something called La Paquete Seminal, which is kind of amazing. It's a two terabyte image that's basically has a lot of stuff in it. It's, um, uh, it's got like soap operas, it's got um, pirated soap operas, of course. It's got uh, <laughs> um, a lot of like books in it. It's got a bunch of videos. It's got some educational materials. It's got health documents. It's got a lot of sort of interesting material that's been all put together into a um, b basically a USB stick. There's no internet in Cuba, so to speak of. It's just only in Havana and nowhere else. Um, and yet a lot of people have access to this kind of stuff. And what ends up happening is that people go around on motorbikes with like USB keys with it on it. And what, for a very modest fee, they will install it on your computer. So that's actually a pretty high bandwidth, right? We talked Cuba was completely black in that map that we had before. But if you have two terabytes coming to your uh, door every couple of weeks, that's actually a pretty good throughput in practice. Um, so uh, I don't know if it should be that color or not, um, but it is an alternate way that people have found to distribute data. Um, Myanmar, that's kind of an interesting example too. Um, who here has heard of Zapia? Yeah, Cosmo. Uh, Zapia is a very popular app outside of it. It's got 450 million downloads, and and they claim, or they claim they've got over 500 million downloads. They claim to have 450 million users. It's basically a peer-to-peer -peer Android app that lets you download information onto your phone and share it with your neighbor. Um, it's got kind of a cute little interface, so you can download a website, cache it. So what ends up happening is that people will go into town, they'll get some access to Wi-Fi, they'll download a bunch of stuff, they'll go home, they'll go back to wherever they live, and then they can share it amongst themselves and they can distribute information that way. And it's got this enormous growth. I recommend reading this article about Myanmar here. It's, it's kind of fat, fantastic. Um, but they've been able to actually sort of propagate amongst themselves sort of articles on you know, sports or or politics. Politics is a hot topic, so the government has strong opinions on this one. But y you know, people really want to have this access, and they always find ways to do that. Um, I don't have an article on it, but there's something called uh, Tusha, which means knapsack in Farsi. This is something that exists in Iran. It's definitely not uh, government sanctioned. Um, it's done by some expats, but what they have done is they've overloaded um, uh, um, basically satellite signals. So uh, they've, they've managed to, to convince some satellite providers who beam uh, um, you know, mu you know, music into, uh, uh, or not music, sorry, um, television. I have old stuff, but uh, <laughs> television to people's homes, they're able to uh, put a backpacking uh, signal on top of it that distributes videos. So if you get a special receiver, which um, looks very much like an, a, a normal one, you can actually get these um, videos, you can get information from it. It's just sort of beamed widely. There's no privacy. You don't have any kind of back and forth signal. It's not a true... Uh, um, it's not a true, uh, you know, TCP connection or anything like that. Um, but people do use it to request information and bypass government sensors. And there's quite a lot of data that actually gets distributed into Iran that way. Um, so, um, you know, going back a couple slides, um, there are a lot of different ways that people have found to distribute data. Uh, a couple other ones that are interesting is BitTorrent or more generally peer-to-peer. -peer. That's something that does exist when you get outside of... Uh, has everyone heard of Popcorn Time? Nave can raise his hand. <laughs> um, it's a very popular way of distributing videos and movies. Um, that actually is a very relevant, you know, BitTorrent is a very relevant way of distribution, especially once you get outside of, um, uh, you know, the main uh, uh, sort of areas. I'm sorry, too far. And um, uh, one other one I want to talk very briefly is that at Endless, we've managed to have a fair amount of luck talking to cell providers about providing... Um, 
data plans for people where they can download information at night when the cell, uh, when there's a dip in cell requirements. If you look at sort of the cell usage patterns, there's a lot of usage during the day when people are awake and basically the entire networks are empty at night. And um, uh, there's a lot of unused bandwidth and people can, they can give that basically away for free. So if you're trying to get information or cacheable data for people, that is a good hour of the day to do it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how we're tackling this problem at Endless. And I want to, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, but Philip is giving an entire talk on this tomorrow at three. So um, that's Philip there. So I will just touch on this and I'd recommend you go to his talk and get a longer one. And what we've done is we sort of broken down uh, the internet for our users into uh, you know, cacheable data, as I talked about, and sort of an interface. And we've started building a suite of applications that um, basically work offline. So um, I can give you a very quick demo of one if I end this presentation. Ah, dear. Thank you, Google. So then really quickly, this is an example of a potential app that works offline. I'm not on the internet right now, but this is, um, I mean, it's like, like Saturn here. This is a very simple astronomy app. So the idea is that we've taken, uh, uh, information on astronomy and made it available even though I'm not on the internet and put a nice face around it and are able to display it to users after the fact. Um, another example of one is, um, let me show you this one here, recipes. This is something we've had a GNOME recipe app for a very long time. Um, this is a slightly different one. Um, we wanted sort of uh, to make recipes available for people. Um, this is another great example of cacheable data. You're looking for a recipe. If you don't have the bandwidth, you just don't have access to that. Um, however, you know, there's nothing saying you couldn't make that available on people's machines, download it when they aren't looking for it, and when it comes time for them to have it, make it useful then. And then, um, so this is a, you know, look for chicken recipes here, chicken parmesan. You can sort of see what that's like here. Um, Again, uh, fairly straightforward, but still extremely useful. Um, and then finally, one last thing uh, I'll show you really fast is an encyclopedia. Um, we made Wikipedia available uh, for people, again, available offline. The idea behind it was that if you're looking for something, if you don't have internet, um, it's still very relevant and useful. So I can look for chicken here, chicken or the egg, sure. Wikipedia never fails to amaze, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, again, I'm still not on the internet right now, uh, but having this information available is something that is very relevant and useful for people. And this, I'm not showing you these to sort of say this is necessarily the path forward. I want really to sort of spark your imagination, um, as to the kinds of things that GNOME as a desktop could be doing and should be doing in order to make a desktop that actually is useful for people. All right, let me see if I can get my slides up here. Um, mm, nope. All right. Success. Maybe. There we go. All right. So he here's basically the big pitch I have. Um, I would like GNOME as a community to start thinking wider than our traditional audience. We've always been very focused on um, uh, you know, our current user base. Our current user base is, frankly, not as diverse as we think it is. Socioeconomically, it's always been you know, going towards the top of the, uh, you know, economic uh, ladder, as it were. And I think that as we, we get outside of our areas, 
of comfort, the sort of problems that we face change too. Um, and I'd really like this to be a thing that we consider. Um, we, you know, we care about languages, we care about internationalization, we care about accessibility. This very much goes along with those two. What good is access if you can't use it? And what good is internationalization if it's not culturally relevant? Um, so a couple of points I wanted to bring is, is to be, be aware of connectivity. This is one that, and I'm looking to do evolution actually. Um, <laughs> evolution is terrible at this, but it'd be great if we could deal a lot more gracefully when the network degrades. This is something that definitely fits into our experiences a bit more. You know, we always have spotty internet at things like coffee shops or on planes or at conference Wi-Fi or at the hotel that we're staying at. But, um, uh, y you know, that's a fact of life and that's basic reality for um, over half of the internet users. You just expect that the cell tower goes down or your, your network goes down or you can't afford it or um, whatever it happens to be. Um, and we don't handle the, all that nicely inside of GNOME uh, and we could be better. Um, be aware of bandwidth. Um, for a lot of the world, it's very much a precious resource. Don't always download again. Try to continue downloads. Um, uh, in particular, it's really good to make downloading an explicit act, not an implicit one. If you're doing a lot of network uh, traffic, um, you want to let the user know because people often are very cognizant of how much they've used, how much network they have, left this month and uh, they, they sort of very much budget it like they budget money, they budget bandwidth. And if things mysteriously happen behind the scenes, um, if you're downloading a bunch of updates and you're not aware of it, um, then you can blow through someone's budget and they hate your product. Um, so it's, it's not free, make sure that you're aware of it. Um, caching data, this is something that I sort of uh, brought up with the endless apps, but being able to have information available offline. Things like GNOME Maps are a great example of something that can work well here. We should ship GNOME Maps with a good set of, of default tiles, maybe, so that it's useful if you don't have network, and then, um, or, you know, give you ways of making it available offline. But in general, any way that we can separate data into things that are cacheable and chunkable uh, is a, a good approach. Um, and then language support, this is an area of strength for free software, but uh, I do want to emphasize that it really does matter and really is important and we should keep doing it. And then um, uh, this last second to last one is kind of interesting. Um, when we do our desktop, we always get, uh, y y you know, almost accused of being too simple and too... Uh, straightforward and what we found at Endless when we actually went out and put GNOME in front of people was a lot of the language we used was written for uh, y you know almost college educated people a lot of the the verbiage we use a lot of the language we use Ooh. sorry um, a lot of the language we use is actually too complicated and we've had to rewrite the help manuals in a lot of ways to make it a lot more understandable um, and then finally be open-minded uh, a lot of the problems that we're solving are not necessarily the problems that the world faces. However, people will tell you when you ask them and, you know, at some level have been telling us for a long time the kind of problems that they have and uh, it would be good to listen and adjust. Um, I want to propose that we make this sort of a concept. I don't have great suggestions here. Um, but we talk about like accessibility is something that we absolutely care about. Um, we talk about, um, you know, and we, we, icon we iconify it by having A11Y as something that we throw around as a concept that we care about. Um, I had a couple suggestions here. Um, I'm open for more suggestions. I don't like either of these, but y y you know, uh, I, I do want to really increase awareness of uh, these kind of challenges within the project, and I'd like for us to start keeping that in mind as we uh, uh, continue to develop the desktop. And the first one is supposed to be spotty internet. I don't know. Don't know if it really works, but um, thank you very much. And uh, at this point, I'll take some questions. I'll
Allison. I did. Uh, yeah, it's. Um, well, I have strong opinions this week about the suitability of LibreOffice, and uh, um, uh, I'll talk about that one later. Um, <laughs> that's a whole other forty-five minute presentation, but. Um, uh, but yeah, no, and, and actually it was a problem for me because I wasn't able to work on my slides on the flight and um, I had a lot of trouble writing them last night when I was trying to get the hotel wireless to work. And um, I thought, yes, it's stripping with irony. However, um, it, I just about got through this presentation, so... Oh, that's, a, that's a good point. So I, th I think uh, I'm looking at that from an endless perspective where there are multiple events that people can get, you know, their information. And one of them is when you get your operating system for the first point. And that's often done via like a install USB stick or you get it preloaded on your machine um, or you, you, you manage to get. It. So I'm thinking more of a pre-installed chunking, not as a we give you a bunch of chunks when you do it. But because people can be explicit with that kind of stuff, you see this with Google, like, you know, Google Maps on the cell phone. You can have an area for offline use, but it tends to download it when you're on Wi Fi. Same for Google Translate, you know, it, it offers to download the language packs when you're on Wi Fi. So Google's already starting to develop with this in mind. We don't have that design pattern anywhere in GNOME, which is like download this for offline use. Um, and if you're able to give the user, you know, the visibility that this is a big download, I have it available when I'm not uh, online, they can then make a decision about whether they want to use their, their bandwidth at this time to, to do it. Back up there. Come to Phillips talk tomorrow. Short answer, but yes, our our, our um, uh, that that scenario that we're absolutely working on. Um, any other questions? Uh, I think uh, in Network Manager we already have some awareness that uh, not everything is downloaded if you have a 3G connection uh, via a USB uh, modem attached, and I have a garden plot. And there I have a Wi-Fi router and I put in a 3G stick to have uh, internet uh, during garden time. So, but for my, for my laptop, uh, he thinks it's uh, Wi-Fi, so let's download everything, but I only have, only have 500 megabytes. So it would uh, be a great improvement if we ju just had a network manager or somewhere uh, that we can mark our connections as low bandwidth or uh, use less data and just... Uh, yeah, have some rules there, or maybe say that uh, at night uh, this connection can be used, but uh, during daytime uh, th this would not be so great. So uh, just in Network Manager, we can have some small things that would uh, improve the situation very much. Any file. Yes, yeah, so it's already available, basically. However, I'd say that whether or not it's available, we're not taking great advantage of it in the desktop. So making it very explicit to users is something that I don't think we've we've done in a way. University of Berkeley, and uh, basically, it's uh, the people that did TCP that are thinking of uh, how they're going to fix the internet. And one of the things they do is they say is that to make that work, you really need to tag your data and not your endpoints, um, and say, okay, this data is cacheable. Uh, you should cache it this way and this way and this way, and and that needs. Um, 
really um, to to um, get into the system really deeply because you need to stop using your know, HTTP URLs without knowing what data you have behind. Uh, and so I think that's what uh, Jonathan was uh, was talking about. You know, like starting to think the strategies that allow us to know beforehand what kind of data we have and have caching mechanism not only in Network Manager but in Glib uh, directly uh, from the resource we have. Any other questions? Federico. <laughs> Making you run, Dave. Hey, um, are you doing anything about offline maps? Offline maps? I'd love to. We're not doing anything at this moment. It's sort of on the roadmap as in we should really do something about that. Um, uh, but I'd love it if anyone, you know, is inspired to take it up and, and run with it until we get around to it. Uh, Gnome Maps needs some manpower. So around uh, CZ meaning for, you know, a map server within Gnome.org and uh, some development work. So would Endless be willing to sponsor that or? <laughs> I think so. I think we can try and make something happen on the server front for, for one, for sure. So let's talk about that one. All right. In fact, I think we talked about that with the Sysamin team in the past, but we ran into uh, Sysamin constraints on getting something like that installed and up and running. So I think, unfortunately, we're out of time. So thank you very much, Jonathan. All right, thank you.